meeting you right where you are on your foster care journey. This is The Forgotten Podcast. Hello and welcome to The Forgotten Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Cabe, and I am so happy to be with you. If you are part of the foster care community, passionate about serving, or simply interested in learning more, we are here for you. In every episode of this podcast, you will hear stories from men and women who have experienced foster care to one degree or another. They may have grown up in the system, are caseworkers, foster parents, or others who are here to bring you hope or encouragement. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe and share it with a friend. And remember, you are not alone. I hope you enjoy the Forgotten Podcast. Well, today I have the privilege of talking to Blake Boyer. Blake is a Christian. She's a wife and a mom. She's also been a social worker in the field of child welfare for over seven years. And she has a master's in social work and is a trust-based relational intervention, also known as TBRI, practitioner. Blake, thank you for being willing to share your experiences. Thank you for being here here today. Awesome. Well, I'm so glad you're here. And I w- we're just going to we're just going to jump right in here and I want to know what actually led you to pursue social work in the first place. <laughs> well, you probably hear this from a lot of social workers, but I did not <laughs> intend on going into social work um, <laughs> in the first place. I actually was in school for missions to train to go cross culturally to, you know, other parts of the world to share the gospel. And Hmm. Along the way in college, there was a huge need in our community um, for a lot of different things. But there were a lot of hurting families. We, Our college was in a very high-risk community. And hmm. in that process of helping families in that uh, place, I discovered just the need we have here domestically, A, but then B, um, the ways in which the church is not active, you know, in high risk communities. Um, and, uh, I kind of got roped into social work that way. <laughs> and I just <laughs> kept kind of getting pulled down that path until one day I found myself in a full time social work job. Amazing. Amazing. So why do you, why would you say that Christians should be involved? in this work? Because you just mentioned a lot of times that's not the case. Why do you think they should be involved in this work, in social work specifically? Yeah. So what I tell Christian social workers all the time is that the world, the secular world, or anyone coming from a different worldview really does not have a sound foundation for helping others. And by that, I mean, you know, the whole basis of social work is to do no harm, but also it's the dignity and worth of people. Mm. Um, and where does that come from? Mm. Why do people have dignity and worth? You know, if we all came from primordial soup and we're all just some happy cosmic accident, why does it matter if parents abuse their children? Why does it mm. matter that people uh, drink to excess or ruin their lives, you know, or any of that. Mm. Why do people matter on a deep intrinsic level? And the answer, of course, is that we are made in the image of God. And he mm. has said, you have value, you have worth, I've created you. Because I've created you, you have meaning. And you're to treat each other, you know, a certain way. And you're to help one another in your communities in a certain way. And so, um, You know, that's the big piece for me is that we as believers have all of the reasons to be Mm. involved in this work, all of the right reasons. And so we as the church, we should be on the front lines of social work. Mm, I love that so much. That's I totally agree. Um, let's, let's kind of go personal in your life. Like what talk up to us about your specific role. Um, and I'm guessing you've had a variety. It seems that that is the case in social work. A lot of times people are one role for a time and then switch. So would love to know about kind of what it looks like to be you in this field of social work. Yeah, um, I have done case management. Um, what I started out doing is what I call street social work. And <laughs> that was uh, I ran a tutoring program in my community mm. And even though our focus was tutoring the kids who, um, you know, generationally had not 
completed their families had not completed high school. And like, we had those goals, you know, to get them ahead educationally. Mm -hmm. What that kind of turned into was ministering to their whole family and kind of helping them in that way. And that was very unprofessional. (laughs) That was just me kind (laughs) of piecing it together as I went. Um, Some days I look back on that with a lot of uh, fondness, like wishing I could go back to something more (laughs) like that. Um, Because there's pros and cons, you know, to being in a more professional role. Um, now I work mm-hmm. more at a macro level. Um, I assist orga- foster care organizations in our state, uh, be in mm. compliance with state regulations, but also um, just develop high quality, hopefully, you know, high quality foster homes and um, things like that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, I know that at TFI, like our focus is really about connecting the church to the foster care community. And I get this question a lot, like, how do you do this with state agencies? Do you do, is it only with private agencies? And we do both. But um, people ask, how do you navigate this world between state and church, right? Church and state. And so really, I would love to ask you a similar question. How do you navigate faith and your work in this field specifically? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, we've had in Georgia really cool um, partnership between faith-based agencies and the Mm. state, the state really recognizing that we need our faith-based partners um, Mm. to do this work for kids. And so that's really awesome for me personally. Um, you know, as a social worker, I have an ethical responsibility to help everyone in my role um, that comes to me, you know, or that is part Mm -hmm. of my service. Um, There's definitely times where I have been uh, faced with an ethical dilemma, something that goes against Mm. my faith. And you have to say, like, I need to be taken off this case. I can't do this. Um, Mm. Whatever the implications of that are, you know, you may reprimand, whatever, you know, I, I can't ethically in my mm-hmm. personal beliefs do what I'm being asked to do. Um, and so you have to know when to, uh, if you're in a more public role, set mm-hmm. that aside. Um, and while also not compromising your own personal convictions and beliefs mm-hmm. is very important. Um, so yeah, that's definitely, there's a lot of layers there. Um, yeah. and there's, Ethical decisions in this field can be very, very, very complex. Um, Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you also have to realize like everyone is making a. uh, So often our decisions in this field involve worldview determinations. So Mm -hmm. often if you can get to the heart of, okay, what is what where is everyone coming from as far as their perspective? Mm -hmm. um, You can get to a compromise while also honoring uh, everyone's individual worldviews, belief systems, um, and things like that. So, and as a believer, you know, we want to honor differences, um, uh, and serve and love others, especially when we're in a public role. And so, um, you know, I really feel I'm called to do that. Mm, I love that. I love that so much. Um, Blake, you talk to us about the first months you've been, you've been at this now for several years, but how did expectations that you kind of came in with line up with reality? What did that look like? Oh gosh. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I would say, uh, there's this feeling I think most child welfare social workers have where in that first month, you realize you've gotten into something that's way over your head. And the first, (laughs) well, I think for most people, the first instinct is to run. Like I got to get out of here. Mm. (laughs) I got to quit. This is overwhelming, Mm. you know? Um, And then I think the next thing after that for me was, wow, my eyes have been opened to this whole world of need. It's like an endless bottomless pit of need. Let me just run myself ragged to try to meet Mm. these needs. And that's not the right response either. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I think it's just a a general state of overwhelm. That's definitely what I felt. Just the Mm. sheer volume of things I needed to know that I didn't know that my schooling did Mm -hmm. not prepare me for. 
Um, you're given responsibilities <laughs> that you feel like you should not have. <laughs> you feel like you should not be responsible mm. for all these people and all these families. Mm. Um, it, it's daunting to say the least. <laughs> That I, 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 that's such an interesting thought of you're coming in as a young 20 something and they're like, here, this family is under your care and this family is under your care and this child is under your care. That is intense. Yeah. Very, very intense. (laughs) Wow. Well, let's dive a little bit further. Um, I know that you recently shared on Instagram this when I was 23 freshly hired with no child welfare experience, I utterly disregarded secondary trauma. I thought, how could I ever compare the trauma or pain of witnessing what someone else is experiencing firsthand? Oh, how I was so wrong. I would love for you to share, Blake, more about what is secondary trauma. We talk about this on the podcast, but for maybe newer listeners um, and how how you experienced it and what you felt like as a worker. Oh yeah. Secondary trauma um, is basically uh, the trauma that a helping person and the helping profession experiences while they're helping people who are going through, so to speak, the primary trauma. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, and many, if you're, uh, if you've never been in a social work uh, role, or in a helping profession, you've probably felt this in your life when you have a friend or a close family member go through something really, really traumatic and extreme. And then you are the main one by their side, helping them through that, Mm. uh, you know, getting them through that every step of the way. It's draining to be that helping Mm. person. And it does have effects on you um, that you may be... uh, ignorant to, or the effects that may be silent at first, but as time goes on, Mm. they're going to wear on you and wear on you until suddenly you're having trauma responses that, Mm. um, you know, you're wondering where are they coming from? Why, why I haven't been through the primary trauma. I haven't been through that. So why am I having these trauma responses? Um, and so with secondary trauma, I think for social workers, kind of like I said, we have a tendency to say, well, I'm not the one going through it. You know, I'm in this helping Mm. role so I can keep going. I can do more. I can put in more hours. I can, you know, neglect meals or my family, or I can sacrifice Mm. these things for the greater good. Um, And that response is so deadly because what happens is, Mm something in your personal life or in your, with your mental health will come to a boiling point where you don't have a choice anymore. You're going to have to uh, do something drastic to take care of yourself Mm. or your family. And I've seen that play out time and time again with coworkers Mm. that I have um, who either keep pushing through it and watch their mental health or their family decline or they mm. just say one day, well, I got to quit. I'm out of here. And mm. I'm sure a lot of foster parents listen to your podcast. That's one of the main reasons for caseworker turnover that they so often complain about is that burnout and that secondary trauma. Mm. And you're going to see these caseworkers continue to burn out until agencies uh, do better staff care do better training on secondary trauma, but also just have better working conditions. You know, Mm. we social workers have hard in child welfare. I'll say they can just have horrible working conditions where they're expected to work, you know, 50, 60 hours um, Mm. with very few breaks, you know, and what happens is there's so much that needs to be done that it's hard for people to see that that's happening Um, until again, one day it just totally breaks down and then you're at square one and you don't have any caseworkers. So, Hmm. um, yeah, I've just seen that play out time and time again. Hmm. What would be some indicators? Maybe you're like that a friend of a caseworker might be observing or someone personally going, I don't know what's going on with me, but I'm experiencing this, this and that. What would some of those things be? Yeah, I think, um, getting home and checking out, escaping, 
whatever that mm. is for you, you know, finding ways to escape reality. I think for a lot of people, it's like Netflix and TV. Mm. Um, it may even be alcohol, you know, something like that. Um, but re- things that you used to enjoy, like your hobbies um, mm. or, you know, spending time with your kids. You're having a hard time spending time with your kids and having fun. Uh, mm. Things like that um, where you see that uh, those behavioral patterns changing for the worse, I think for a friend looking from the outside. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that uh, you'll start to hear them say things like, well, I just have to, I have to, I have mm-hmm. to, I, and, and this incessant talking about work all the time. Like I used to mm-hmm. live with some of my coworkers as roommates and we would just have to get to the point where I was like, guys, we got to stop talking about work. I mean, we could Mm. talk about this all day, you know, but we we have to make a rule that at the threshold, there is no Mm. talk. And you can make that same rule in your marriage, even though, you you know, Mm. you're probably not sharing details and stuff. But the weight of just the Mm. burdens of the day are weighing on you. And so, um, you know, I, I think that those practices in your personal life, setting up boundaries it'll be really clear mm-hmm. if you don't have boundaries, you know, and as a friend, you need to turn to your friend and say, Hey, you can stop, you know, at five o'clock, mm-hmm. you can tell them I have to go home. <laughs> you know, you can set a boundary mm-hmm. and you may force them to make a decision about you and your employment or mm-hmm. whatever. And guess what? That's fine. Because <laughs> the mm-hmm. reality is in most social work jobs, uh, unless you did something super unethical, you're probably not going to get fired or anything like that. If you set a boundary, <laughs> um, it's hmm. probably just going to be respected is what's going to happen. And they're going to find a different way for the work to get done. And so what hmm. I tell social workers all the time is like, if you all set boundaries, well, then guess what? The work doesn't get loaded on anyone else. They're forced to then make a decision. Well, do we hire more workers? Do we hmm. pay them more? Do we change how the work is done so that everyone, everyone's boundaries can be respected? And these aren't crazy things, mm. right? This is like, yeah. I would like to work yeah. 40 hours, you know, or I would like to leave the office at five, like normal people do. You know, this is not crazy stuff mm. we're asking for here. Um, so, yeah, I, I, those boundaries are super important. And you'll start to see yourself waffling on those or not making them at all. Mm. If you have mm. that secondary trauma and it's really taking over. Yeah. So. Mm. Do you feel like that kind of mentality of if not me, then nobody where you feel like I'm the only mm-hmm. one who can help. Do you feel like those kinds of things are, are often there? Yes. And that we, mm-hmm. that's very important to call that out for what it is. That is a prideful position. So if you're a believer, you know, thinking to yourself, well, I'm the only one I, I have to do this. That's not true. Like God mm-hmm. is greater <laughs> than you. And um, <laughs> you are not, you know, the healer of all people. <laughs> you are not um, yes. the savior of all people. You know, it is not in your control or in your hands at all. And that should be freeing that, um, mm-hmm. you know, I was just talking to someone that had messaged me about this. And I told him, you know, you know what I used to do is I would get in my car every day after work and say like, Lord, what I did today was an offering to you. I feel Mm. kind of discouraged. I feel like it wasn't enough. (laughs) You know, I, I'm Mm. really, I'm bringing all these things to you. Like, and I need you to work in them and do something about them. But what I did today, it was for you. And, you know, Mm. help me feel at peace about what I did today. And kind of, you know, take it off of my shoulders and give it to him because it's going to weigh heavy on you. And and in that yeah. doing that, you're reminding yourself, OK, I'm not the savior of the world. I'm not the heal. And you're humbling yourself before God. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, really, really helpful. I agree. And I think that when you are humbling yourself, like you said, it should be freeing. It, it will be freeing when you actually do release control and say, I am not the one in control. Um, everything feels like it's on me, but it's not. It's not ultimately on me. I am responsible for what I can do um, and doing it faithfully. But the rest is up to him. Right, right. Hmm. 
So I know you know this. Um, workers have so much on their plates. Um, they are often overlooked and underpaid. I think, too, that, like you said, a lot of times they probably suffer quite silently until they're like, I can't do it anymore. And then we give up, right? Um, and you've written about this recently. And we're talking about boundaries. And I'm just going to follow up with what you've said here. And if you want to add any more to it, that's great. Um, but you've shared child welfare is not like other industries. Workers will always be tempted to fall into two ruts. Either cut yourself off from caring too much because the burdens are too great or spend every waking hour working because the burdens are too great. Talk about those two ruts. And I'm guessing you've probably seen both, maybe even in your own life. Yes, yes. I've been on either side of those two ruts. And mm. I remember it because one day uh, when I was in a more callous season, you know, I had cut myself mm -hmm. off from caring um, like I should. And a foster parent kind of addressed that with me. You know, they kind of called mm -hmm. me out on it. They were like, you need to care more about this. Like this should be more mm -hmm. of an emergency to you. And um, that mm -hmm. really hit home with me. And I had to go back and evaluate myself. And I had just realized that I had become so defeatist in my mentality mm -hmm. as a worker that um, I had let it, you know, push me into that rut and just asking the Lord to soften my heart and give mm -hmm. me peace about all the things I can't do and how limited my role is, um, all the horrible things that you see. And, it, you know, it can be so tough when you work so hard, like the first time you go all in on a case, you do mm. everything you can you work so hard and then something just completely nullifies it, whether it's the court system mm. or your superiors or this person you've been fighting so hard for them to change. They just choose to completely mm. give it all up. Um, it can mm. be really demoralizing. And so that, you know, that rut and that's where foster parents, I think, they experience that with caseworkers where they just can't fathom how this person is so callous, you know, or they feel mm. like they're just a checkbox when the caseworker comes to their house. You know, they, they mm -hmm. feel like the caseworker isn't personally invested and, you know, you don't want them to be enmeshed or like personally invested mm -hmm. to an unhealthy degree in a case, but you also want them mm -hmm. to be a human, right? You want them to care. Right. You don't want them to be a robot and, um, I think foster parents get frustrated with that easily, but if they know why that person got there, where that came from, I think that could really help them navigate that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other side I probably have seen more is you have mm. caseworkers and social workers that make this their life. Their whole life becomes mm. about their caseload, about child welfare you know, they're doing hmm. things, volunteering on the weekends. They're doing things for uh, their caseload, even when they're not clocked in. Um, they're working with other organizations on the weekend, doing child welfare related mm. things. And that's just not healthy either. It's just not. And hmm. one of two things is going to happen. Like I said, you're going to get to a breaking point with your mental health or with your family or, hmm. um, and you're going to have to make a decision or you're going to keep going and uh, it's going to ruin your mental health in your family. Um, and I've seen that right. happen way more than I like uh, to mm. admit. And um, I've told people I've told, I've sat down with some of my coworkers and <laughs> said, you need to find another job, <laughs> you know, like you need to get in another mm. profession uh, because this is really running your life. And, um, it's not okay. And it, it's so hard because this isn't, you have to acknowledge that in child welfare in particular, um, it's not, it's just not like other jobs. You're dealing with mm -hmm. children and their lives and their well being. So when you don't mm -hmm. get something done, it tangibly affects that child for the negative, mm -hmm. you know, it tangibly affects their parent for the negative. It's not like it's a, uh, you're doing data entry or, um, right. Engineering, you know, these other fields that there are tasks that can be put off that don't have like major personal consequences for somebody. 
But when you don't uh, get these things done for your children and your families, I mean, it's a big deal. I mean, it is a big deal. And so Mm -hmm. you have to acknowledge that um, this is different. It's a different Mm -hmm. profession and we need to treat it differently actually than um, some other employment. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, I feel like that hasn't really, that kind of consideration hasn't made it to the field as a whole yet. And I would love to see that Mm -hmm. change um, because until that changes, you're going to get people, you're going to get well-meaning, loving caseworkers, mm-hmm. individuals mm-hmm. Right. that want to do everything they can to do right by people. And that's not a wrong motivation. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the problem right. is just right. that you're going to lose those people eventually. They're, mm-hmm. If they can't take care of their own lives, their own mental health and their own families, they're not even going to be able to do it for very long. So it's, it's right. really a balancing act um, on those yeah. two sides of things. Yeah, I think that's really an important thing to think through. And it it makes me think, yeah, boundaries is so critically important, healthy boundaries and healthy rhythms. And but that requires training that requires like permission and like reminders and like we want you to do this and building it into the flow. I mean, it's it requires something to change. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it requires um a system wide change. Um, and actually TBRI, um, and the Karen Purvis Institute, they have a really cool way of looking at this and applying TBRI to organizations and to child Mm. welfare as a whole and, uh, making more restorative practices from the top down to be more sustainable. Mm. And that's the type of thing that I think the industry, industry, the profession as a whole should um, look at and try mm. to implement because if you treat child welfare like a business, it's never going to go well. <laughs> and, you know, you see mm. some agencies treat it only like a business, like we're just going to do that. And then other ones say, no, we're helpers. We are healers and we're just going to treat it like that. And mm. you have to have um, a healthy mix of both, you know, of both realities to make a child welfare agency function well. Hmm. What, when you think about speaking to a foster parent and, and hopefully as, as those listening hear this and maybe as, as others kind of think through this, when they might go, okay, so what can I do as a foster parent who's already kind of struggling often, but I still want to be a support to my worker because I know that we're a team on behalf of these kids. Like, how can I do that in a way? I mean, personally, I remember when we were foster parents and I really appreciated our worker. And I, so one time I wrote her a card and got her a gift card and was just thinking this would be so, you know, I would do this for a friend or a teacher or something for my kids. And she was like, thank you, but I can't receive this. Um, because, and I don't know if that was her personal or if that is a policy you can't, I mean, I can see how it it could look like I'm trying to bribe or something, which obviously wasn't my intent, but I think sometimes as foster parents, you're like, well, how can I help them then? Cause I want to help. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I tell people that about gifts all the time. Um, and that's Hmm. a good rule, um, because it can be perceived as a bribe. Um, so that goes for gift cards, monetary gifts, anything like that. Just don't Mm -hmm. put your caseworker in that awkward position of having to refuse it. Um, so that's not a good way to go, but really it's just about being a good Christ follower, a good, Mm. uh, believer walking on this earth to whoever walks through your door. And the challenge is sometimes that caseworker is really, or feels like your enemy because Mm. of their attitude. Um, you know, maybe it's, you have an issue with the way they do their work or whatever. And that's like worst case scenario, but it doesn't matter if it's the worst case scenario or the best case scenario with your caseworker, you're called to love them. Um, Jesus Mm. tells us to love our enemies, you know, and so it's really about seeing them as a human being. And 
if you can even think a little bit deeper too about what might be motivating them, how are they, what perspective are they coming at the case from? And how can I Mm. actually put myself in their shoes and hear that perspective and then be an active listener, reflect that back to them so they know I know Mm. exactly what they're saying, where they're at, you know, but then I still disagree. Those conversations can Mm -hmm. be super, super powerful because nine times out of 10, um, it's things lost in translation and communication. Um, A lot of times I think caseworkers really just want to know that foster parents get it, that they get their perspective. Mm. You know, we can still differ and be on opposing sides of an issue, but if we can respect where one another is coming from, we can still move forward and work together. Um, you know, and mm. most of the times that's we're both here for the good of the child, yeah. for their well being. Yep. We just see that end or that result or the method differently. Um, and mm-hmm. so, as long as we're both, you know, coming for that same end goal, we should be able to work together. And so, I think, you know, for me personally, when I would walk into someone's house and I felt, um, welcomed, but also, uh, in their questions, not that they're asking me really anything personal or anything like that, but just cared Mm -hmm. for, you know, I can see that they see me as not just someone who can give them information or, uh, you know, can Mm -hmm. do something for them, but they see me as a team member. They see me as someone, Mm -hmm. uh, they want to work with, they want to understand more. Um, Mm -hmm. that always was super helpful and super refreshing for me, right? Because as a social worker, you're dealing with people that are belligerent with you and difficult, um, Mm. all the time, all the time. And so (laughs) for foster parents, uh, a lot of times we just really crave, like, can this relationship just be easier? (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. can it just be refreshing? Can this visit to this foster home not be a difficult part of my day? That would be awesome, you know? Mm. <laughs> and so I just encourage your, let your, your home be a refreshing place. Even if you have to disagree, you know, f- figure out how to do that well and to understand mm-hmm. one another um, can go a really long way. And then about the gift thing, in lieu of a gift, if your caseworker is doing a great job, brag on them <laughs> to their supervisor. Uh, give them mm. the, those uh, encouragement, those words of praise, because they do not get it, y'all. <laughs> they do not get mm. encouragement. They do not get praise. I mean, in court, it's you haven't done enough. You got to do better. Mm. Uh, a lot of times in, when you're staffing a case with your supervisor, they can be encouraging. But the reality is, I don't know anyone who's done everything they can do for a child on their case and is totally up mm-hmm. to speed all because there's always more always. Right. So, you know, they're in those staffings and they're hearing you haven't done enough. You need to do more. And then they're interacting with birth parents who are rightfully frustrated. The system is frustrating, mm-hmm. you know, and they're mm-hmm. hearing this is awful. I'm sick of you. You're the worst. And so then Mm. to get that from the foster parents as well, it can just feel like a pile on, you know, it really can. Um, So yeah, the Mm. words of encouragement are huge. Mm. Ah, I I appreciate that. And it makes a ton of sense. And I loved the idea of telling your supervisor that that's great. That's very tangible, something you can do. And even when you talk about disagreeing respectfully, like again, going back to what you said as believers or not even as believers, as people, we are all made in the image of God. So all people have dignity and worth. So when we disagree and when we agree, let's treat each other as people made in the image of God. Um, Yes. One, as we kind of start to close out here, Blake, I want to know how your personal faith has grown or has it as you've worked in child welfare? Hmm. This is probably the thing. Well, this piece, this part of my faith that has grown is the thing that I find myself talking about the most these days. Um, and I don't know why. I think it's because... <laughs> we really, really need to hear this, you know, or I keep encountering people that really, really need to hear it. But um, I have just really learned to trust in God's sovereignty over all things. And 
um, seeing so much evil in the world and pain and hopelessness, you really, really need to believe in a loving, all powerful Mm. God that he um, is in control, that his ways are higher than mine. If I can't see what he's doing in a situation to believe and know that he's still doing something, I don't have the Mm. full perspective. You know, I have a very narrow perspective and to me, it may seem all hopeless, all bad. You know, there's nothing redeeming here. And then time and time again, the Lord has shown me, nope, you just saw one part. (laughs) You just saw Mm -hmm. that little bit. And all these stories, Blake, sometimes I show you what I did, but a lot of times I don't. And you have to trust me. You have to lean on me that I am weaving together all this pain, all this sin into a picture that is more beautiful had it not been there. Just Mm. like the cross, like God's son went to die and bear the wrath of God. That seemed really Mm. hopeless. (laughs) Like that seemed (laughs) awful. You know, if you're the disciples, you're like, how could it be this way? You know, how could it be Mm. this? He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. But then he rose again on the third day and he has brought new life and he conquered sin and death. And now he holds the keys to death and hell. So it's like that has Mm. zero power that's been defeated. And not only that, but he has walked through every hardship, every temptation that we will experience. And he conquered that. (laughs) And he can now walk beside Mm. us as a merciful and faithful high priest, being tempted in all the ways we were yet without sin and can sympathize with our weaknesses, you know? So like that, him going through that made the outcome infinitely better, you know, and we can trust that God is doing that with all things. He's going to make all things new. Mm -hmm. Um, All our pain will have a purpose, you know, it's storing up Mm -hmm. for us an eternal weight of glory that we cannot even fathom. And that's what we have to preach to ourselves in this field is that, you know, we can't see it now, but there's hope. Anything we mm. go through in this life, really, you know, like anything, mm-hmm. suffering and pain and trials, we have to hope in a future glory. Um, and that's been the main thing that I found myself put in a rock and a hard place where I've realized mm. like either I'm going to have to actually believe that or I'm going to lose my faith. <laughs> like I, I have to <sighs> actually believe that and let it change me or mm. I'm going to stop believing altogether. You know, when you're faced with, um, the darkness of the world a lot. So, um, yeah, that, that is like, that has grown me so much actually mm. walking that out in faith. Wow. Thank wow. you for the way you expressed all of that and presenting the gospel. I, I think that's really, this is what I love about talking to people who are engaged in the foster care community in some way is Everyone that I ask this question to, have you experienced Jesus more? Have you grown closer to Jesus? It's the same because when we get out of our comfort zones and when we get into a place that is beyond us and when we are caring for the people he tells us to care for, he changes us. Like it just, it's, and it's incredible and it's hard and it's messy. And yet it's so, I mean, my life has never been the same, right? And it's exciting and it's thrilling and I'm humbled and it's like the Lord is just so good. Yeah. Yeah. He is so good. And it's really cool how when he stretches you and you think, oh, I'm going to break. I can't do this anymore. He just like gives you more grace and shows you more of himself, you know? Yeah. 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 Man, Blake, it's been great to talk with you. I want to give you the final word just to speak to your fellow social workers out there. Um, just whatever you, on your heart to share with those listening. This is this is for them. Yeah. Just, I would say, don't grow weary in doing good. Don't grow weary in doing the right thing and not taking the shortcuts and caring all the way, but also setting your boundaries, you know, um, Mm. don't grow weary in doing good because there is a reward. Uh, just rely on the Lord. Like he is there to lift you up. Don't rely on your own strength. Um, 
and yeah, continue in the work, take care of yourself, continue in the work because, um, it is rewarding. It really is. Hmm. Thanks, Blake. Thank you. Well, I hope that today's episode encouraged you wherever you are on your foster care journey. We want you to stay connected, so be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you will never miss an episode. Also, we have great content at theforgotteninitiative.org. Thank you for watching. I cannot wait to be with you next time.